One of my, actually one of my most favorite people in this world is Clayton Christensen. For the last four years, he has been named by a very prestigious magazine, the most influential business thinker in the world. And he wrote a book entitled, How Will You Measure Your Life? At the end of the book, he makes this conclusion. He says, and you know my life, what really matters most to me is not how much money I made or how much successful I was with my profession or academia or how many awards I won. Those things are important, but what matters most to me is how I have been able to help other people one by one to become better. As I was pondering about this and what matters most in life, I went back to an experience I had many years ago. And it was a time in which I was working in a supermarket and I was struggling with clinical depression. And one specific day I was feeling really down, really sad. Even with suicidal thoughts. And as I was delivering the bags to the clients, I recall an experience that I will never forget. A lady stood in front of me and she wouldn't move. So I raised my head and I looked, I looked into her face. And she stepped forward and she looked into my eyes. And with a very compassionate look, she said to me, are you doing okay? And that truly touched me to the point that when she left, I went to the back room and I started to weep. Because I was overwhelmed with joy and gratitude that someone acknowledged of my suffering. And that made a huge difference in that day. In that day. And I am afraid that experiences like this simple that you may have also some of those for sure, I hope, are less likely to happen today. And you may say, why? Wherever we go, we find that people increasingly are choosing digital connection over human or face-to-face -face connection. And this is troubling to me, especially when I step the very first day of class, when I step into my classroom, and I find almost every single student with a very, with pure silence, that also choose digital connection versus human connection. Very different when, when I was in college, which everything was a chatting, laughing, and connecting with each other. And I think, it concerns me that I think about one of these students, maybe a freshman, and homesick, or living in the press, and no one is acknowledging his or her presence. And as I have been reflecting on these things and how technology affects our lives, I was thinking, are we really a technology naive people? And what do I mean by this? Let me put a few examples. We all know that obesity is a global epidemic, and one of the solutions is physical activity. But whenever technology offers an opportunity, we, most of us will choose being passive over being active, and let alone being sitting in front of TV, computers, etc. So, another example. 20 years ago, in the islands of Fiji, TV was almost unexistent. And things such as eating disorders, body image issues, and dieting were almost unknown. And three years later, a group of researchers, three years after television made appearance in the homes of the islanders, a group of researchers reported that about 80% of teenager girls, they were dissatisfied with the body image, and they would practice, most of them, dieting, and a few of them, selfing boots, vomiting, in order to change their body appearance, their weight, or their body shape. So they may look more like the people they would see on TV, because they thought they would be more successful. And this is also, the body image thing is also a global epidemic. A few weeks ago, in my class, a few of my students, they were teaching us about body image, and they conducted, and they conducted an experiment. They say, come all of you to the center of the class. If you're completely satisfied, and this is a question I have also for you, if you're completely satisfied with your body, how it looks, etc., they say, go to that side. Otherwise, go to that side. And I was astonished as I was walking to the side, because to me, I'm learning that my looks is not what really matters to me, but it is who I am becoming, and what can I do with my body and my life. But I was astonished that all of my students completely all went to that side. Then they came to the center and they were asked, if you have compared yourself to someone else from this morning until now, it was about 6 p.m., go to that side, or the way to go to that side. And I found myself again alone, and everyone else was there when they are beautiful and handsome. And then I was thinking, this is interesting how technology is acting in our lives. Another group of my students, they were conducting a little experiment also in my class. And they were teaching about technology and health. And in the experiment, they say, 
they gave flashcards, and then they say, put your cell phones outside in the desktop and don't, don't touch them, because this is a non-cell phone policy in my class. And they say, but whenever you feel tempted, put a check mark in the, in the card. And, and again, I was astonished that at the end of the presentation, about 50% of my students, that they felt tempted to check their cell phones in social network, whatever it was, about 20 times. And a small group of them, about 30 times. That was actually about almost one time every minute. It's like this compulsive, like, whoop, my cell phone. Let me see, let me see. When they were supposed to pay attention to class, no? And I've been wondering, and I'm concerned about my students, and I think, what can I do to help them? To help them to be more grounded in the things that really matter most in this life, and to gain more self-control. And because also I was thinking that all these students also, they actually confessed to me that about actually 90% of them or more, because I didn't count exactly the percentage, but it was almost everyone, they text while driving. And this is not just here. It's happening in many places. And in order to find a tool for them, I was wondering, and then it was very clear to me that one of the most powerful tools that I am aware to change people from within is actually fasting. For the last 15 years, I have been skipping at least one meal a month, and for the last 35 weeks, I have been skipping at least one meal a week. And why? As you know, as you may know, people who are searching for a spirituality, purpose in life, to connect more with themselves, or with nature, or with God, or with others, or to overcome weaknesses, or gain self-control, they practice fasting. And research shows that those who practice intermittent fasting, they are more likely to live longer and to have better health. And as I was sharing this in one of my health classes that was about spirituality and health, one of my students said, Joaquin, I also fast, but not only from food. And I said, what do you mean? Come here. He stood in the center of the class. His name was Fish. And he said, I also fast from technology. Once a week, I say, for six hours, I'm not going to check my cell phone. And for six hours, I'm not going to watch TV and focus on things that matter most to me, like helping my roommates or completing my homework. And I thought that that was brilliant. And the concept of fasting for me came something like giving up something good for something greater. And then consider this. If just this campus, I was taking an estimate of 40,000 people, would decide to practice this principle, and we all decide that for one week, for the whole semester, once a week for six hours, we let go of social networking like Facebooking, etc., and Twitter, etc., because those are good means of communication, and yet they are strong means for comparing ourselves to others and seek for social approval. But if we would do this and look to focus in face-to-face -face connections and human connections, at the end of one semester, in this campus, we will have over 4 million hours of opportunity, opportunities for human connections. And if we will decide to skip one meal a week, at the end of the semester, it will be about 700,000 meals. We, we would give $5 for every meal we, uh, we don't eat to someone who needs that. That would mean in some countries, like 700 children, 700,000 children could eat for one whole week, or 14,000 children could eat for one whole year, which is amazing. Just for skipping one meal. And about fasting, is more the fear of fasting or going hungry for a little bit than the doing it. As I have done it for many years, it helps me to keep myself grounded and to focus on the things that really matter most. And as I have been thinking about this, how wonderful it would be if all the campuses, schools, etc., all across the world, will implement this. What a change that would be. So from the bottom of my heart, I invite all of you to consider to fast for change. Thank you.